behind the scenes for the new movie, When the Game Stands Tall. The streak was never our goal. Meet the actors. That's sometimes the hardest thing to do. And the real life inspiration. This is what I meant to do. Plus, I love to play, but in the grand scheme of life, it's this big. The NFL wideout who became a star. It was like a dream come true. With his grandma in the huddle. And I tell you, it was the happiest day of her life. Hey, welcome. You're watching the 700 Club. I want to ask you a question. If somebody sneezes, what is the normal reaction that somebody says? They uh, sneeze. God bless you. Yeah, God, God bless, bless you. you. Yes. Okay. Dyer County, Tennessee, according to a report, I think it was CBS News out of Charlotte, said in a high school class, a uh, boy sneezed. <laughs> okay. And a girl said, God bless you. So what happened to the girl? No, don't tell me. She got kicked out of class. She got suspended from school. And her teacher said there'll be no God talk in this classroom. That is despicable. Tennessee, the Tennessee, the Bible Bell. The What's Bible happening? Bell. But <laughs> that's how bad it's gotten. And you'd think, what in the world is going on? Oh, well, exactly. it's worse than that over in the Middle East. The ISIS savage who severed the head of James Foley is most likely a British citizen. There was a headline in the uh, British London paper said one of the Beatles. I mean, it was kind of a joke. But 3,000 of those Muslim monsters are believed to be Westerners. And that makes ISIS outrageous threat to drown all Americans in blood even more menacing. Mm. Intelligence officials fear these Islamic recruits could get back into the United States before anyone realizes it. Mark Martin has the story. The ISIS militant shown beheading American journalist James Foley speaks English with a British accent. That raised so much concern in the UK, Prime Minister David Cameron cut his vacation short. From what we've seen, it looks increasingly likely that it is a British citizen. Now, this is deeply shocking. British authorities believe several hundred of their citizens could be fighting with ISIS, but that's just a fraction. Some estimates put the number of Western Muslims joining ISIS in Syria and Iraq at up to 3,000. In addition to Britain, they come from France, Denmark, and even the United States, creating a serious danger for the West. The concern is these jihadists will use their Western passports and terrorist training to return home and carry out attacks there. Some of those um, uh, foreign nationals uh, who may at some stage seek to return to their countries of origin and carry out attacks in them. We will be vigilant and we will be relentless. When people harm Americans anywhere, we do what's necessary to see that justice is done. There has to be a common effort to extract this cancer so that it does not spread. Right now, I'm not seeing the U.S. government under the Obama administration taking the kind of action needed to crush ISIS. We need to crush this group, stamp them out before they pose a direct threat to the U.S. mainland. And many people criticize the president for playing another round of golf after talking about the beheading of James Foley. Other Islamic terrorist groups, not just from the West, are now supporting ISIS, including from the Philippines and Yemen. The Obama administration announced Wednesday that the president sent special ops forces to Syria this summer on a secret mission to rescue American hostages, including Foley, but they did not find them. He has stepped up airstrikes against ISIS, but to wipe out that terrorist group, much more military action may be required. Mark Martin, CBN News. You know, the president is wonderful in showing empathy and sympathy for people who've been beheaded. You know, you just think, oh, how empathetic can you get? We're outraged. The civilized world. And then he says, don't you understand, though, ISIS is not on the side of history. Don't you understand? Don't they understand that, that history will ultimately prove them wrong? No, it won't. History will not prove them wrong unless the United States gets in there and kills them. And it's amazing how many people now on the left spectrum who've been saying nice things about Islam are beginning to say, we need to go and kill these monsters. It is an infection that is going to spread and metastasize and is going to hit London, it's going to hit Paris, and it's going to hit New York and Washington. So 
if we don't act now, it's an existential threat to the safety of all of us. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am sorry to tell you that we have a man at the helm in this country who doesn't understand the game. And then the fact that he makes that statement and then runs to the golf course, I mean, that isn't the kind of photo op you want with the leader of a coalition that's going after a group of monsters. Well, in other news, Israel is making Hamas pay a heavy price for its attack on Israeli citizens. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Here's John. Pat, Israel says its targeting campaign has killed three senior Hamas military leaders in Gaza. They were on Israel's hit list for a number of kidnappings and bombings, including the capture of an Israeli soldier eight years ago. John Wagi has that story. For a second day, Israel launched targeted airstrikes to make Hamas leadership pay a price for breaking a ceasefire with more rocket attacks. And Hamas is paying a steep price. The two commanders, Mohammed Abu Smala and Ra'ad Attar, helped plan deadly attacks on Israeli soldiers and civilians, including the kidnapping of soldier Gilad Shalit in 2006. Hamas claims the top terrorist on Israel's list, rocket supervisor Mohammed Deef, escaped an Israeli airstrike that killed members of his family. This message is directed to the Zionist enemy. Mohammed Deef will be the commander-in-chief of the army that will enter the Holy Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. Israel says it is uncertain whether Deef is still alive. And Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, aware of the impact of atrocities committed by ISIS in Iraq, made the link with the terrorists of Hamas. Hamas is ISIS, ISIS is Hamas. They're the enemies of peace, they're the enemies of Israel, they're the enemies of all civilized countries. And I believe they're the enemies of the Palestinians themselves. And I'm, the, I'm not the only one who believes that. Despite continued calls in the UN for a return to talks in Egypt, the fighting in Gaza rages on, and Hamas losses are building by the day. John Wagi, CBN News. Pat, what's it gonna take to end this particular round of violence? I hate to tell you, I think that Hamas is playing a game. I've been talking on this program as to what is going on behind them because it seems uh, irrational, the thing that they're doing. It, it has no basis in, in any kind of rational uh, discussion unless you think what they're trying to do is to incite enough uh, uh, hatred against Israel so that uh, Hezbollah comes in from Lebanon and Syria gets in somehow into the act and Iran comes in on top of it. And that's what they're looking for and that's what I see is going to happen. I understand Israel has just called up another 10,000 reservists, so they're, they're in for the long haul. And uh, Bibi Netanyahu isn't playing games. He's, he's playing for keeps, and you wish that our president would do the same thing. But uh, what's going to stop Hamas? The only thing that's going to stop Hamas is if all of them get destroyed. That, that whole area in uh, Gaza has got to be rooted out, and it's going to be bloody, and it's going to be painful. And when that happens, when Israel happens, when it happens, mark my word, Hezbollah is going to start lobbing rockets in from up in Beirut in that area, and the Syrians will come in, and Iranians will begin to get in the act, too. It'll, it just as sure as the sun rises, it's going to happen. John. Here at home, the American missionary doctor who contracted the Ebola virus while working in West Africa has recovered. Dr. Kent Brantley of Samaritan's Purse is set to be released from an Atlanta hospital today. He fell ill with the virus while treating Ebola patients in Liberia. Aid worker Nancy Reipel also contracted the disease in Liberia while uh, doing missionary work as well. Brantley and Reipel were flown to Emory University Hospital earlier this month for treatment. Reipel also is expected to be released soon. Bank of America has reached a $17 billion settlement with federal and state authorities over the sale of mortgage securities leading up to the 2008 financial crisis. It is the latest and biggest action yet between the government and big banks. But as Paul Strand reports, some critics say these settlements don't really help the financial system at all. To dodge threats of civil or criminal trials, banks are paying huge fines for their supposed financial sins that helped bring the economy low in the 2008 crash, even if they didn't commit those sins themselves. For instance, take the case of J.P. Morgan Chase. They had to pay $13 billion in a settlement with the Justice Department. That amounted to half a year's earnings, and it was the largest penalty ever paid by an American firm up until then. But critics say J.P. Morgan Chase wasn't even involved in most of what the government called misconduct. 
Most of the misdeeds were perpetrated by Bear Stearns and Washington Mutual. The government went to Morgan and asked it to take over those two failing banks. Then years later, went after Morgan for what those two banks did. It was a shotgun wedding where the New York Fed said, please take Bear Stearns. And then to turn around and say, well, you know, you're, you're responsible now legally for what Bear Stearns did. We're going to take it out of your shareholders. And now the federal government is saying, by the way, you're going to have to pay penalties for what those banks did, the very same banks we insisted that you buy. I think that is just a horrible message. It means that in any future financial crisis, the healthier banks are going to say, I don't want anything to do with this. Kirpin says Bank of America is in the same situation as Morgan, paying for the sins of another bank it bought when pushed. You look at Bank of America, they didn't issue those countrywide loans, they bought countrywide afterwards. And the Justice Department has gone after other banks as well. You've seen Citibanks? Their company, Citigroup, is coughing up $7 billion. This is a witch hunt against a lot of these banks that were not necessarily the bad actors in the first place. Why are we going after the, the we should go after the sinners, not the people who are trying to, uh, you know, have a recovery for our economy. The question is, why is the Justice Department doing this? What do they have to gain? Some critics say the administration is trying to placate critics who argue the justice had to go after the major banks for their actions before the crisis in 2008. But others have blasted the Justice Department. A Wall Street Journal editorial called Justice's Settlement with J.P. Morgan Chase last November, the Morgan Shakedown, and said the lesson is how government has used the crisis to exert political control over even the most powerful private financial companies. An Investor's Business Daily editorial called it another mugging on Wall Street. And a columnist for Time Magazine wrote that the Morgan settlement does absolutely nothing to make the financial system safer. Officials appear more concerned about appeasing anger over the financial crisis than doing the harder and more politically contentious work of re-regulating the banking system properly. And Kirpin agrees Justice's actions aren't really helping matters, but he says they are hurting the economy because banks are so frozen in fear, they're leery of loaning money. Instead, they're saving up billions in case they have to pay fines in the future. It's very difficult to get loans, and that has a very negative impact on the economy, uh, not just in housing, but across the economy, because small businesses in particular are finding it very difficult to get financing right now. Now, all of the banking system has this hammer over its head, which is the federal government and the Justice Department coming after them for activities that many of the banks weren't even involved in. So I don't think it's fair, I don't think it's good economics, and I think it's an abuse of the power of the federal government. Paul Strand, CBN News, Washington. Pat, your thoughts, does this help or hurt the financial system? You gotta be kidding, of course it hurts it. I just can't understand what's going on. It is a bait and switch, it is, the, it is a, a betrayal of the first order. You remember back in the days of George Bush presidency and the banks were failing and uh, uh, you know Bear Stearns was going down, Lehman Brothers going down and so forth. And so they decided they want to come up with a $750 billion TARP package uh, to rescue troubled banks. And in that package, they, they were saying the real sickos will pass them over to some of these healthy banks. And in order to accommodate the Treasury Department, J.P. Morgan says, okay, we'll take over somebody. And then they, they went to Bank of America, said, you're a healthy bank. How about taking over this uh, countrywide deal that was Mozilla and his cronies out there in the West Coast? And... Uh, you'll do us a great favor. And so uh, Bank of America said, okay, we'll do it. Now they come back around and say, well, uh, whoops, we got you. You took over somebody that was bad. And you say, well, we did it to accommodate you. You asked us to do it, government. And now government says, we're going to get you 17 billion. Is it gonna help? Of course not. It's going to weaken the banking structure. This is the uh, profit, I believe, of uh, the Bank of America for the last two or three years, and they're going to strip them of those profits. Who gets the money? It goes back into the Treasury, I guess. But I mean, who got hurt? And what, are they, what is Treasury trying to do? And, and, and why is Bank of America rolling over? Well, they roll over under the threat of criminal prosecution. Why do you prosecute somebody who's doing what you ask them to do? You're doing the government a favor, and the government hits you in the head. We've got a bad government. It is dangerous to every human being. If they'll do that to uh, Chase, if they'll do that to the Citicorp, if they'll do that to Bank of America, they'll just as easily do it to you. Now, I want to call on my good friend Al Gore and tell him 
the Farmer's Almanac goes against your doctrine. What are you going to do about it, Al? John. <laughs> Pat, get ready for a cold, cold winter. That's the prediction from the old Farmer's Almanac. It says the eastern two-thirds of the country will face a super cold winter, which translates into colder than average temperatures of about two to five degrees difference. The Almanac's editor calls it refrigeration. The book also predicts summer will be warmer than usual in most places, and California's drought will likely continue. The Almanac makes long-range forecasts by referring to the study, study of sunspots and prevailing weather patterns. And Pat, I don't know if you know this, but the 223-year-old publication has about an 80% success rate. Burr. Get your fur coat out. <laughs> I'm, I've, got, I've got great winter clothes, and we just haven't had any. So I'm, I'm, We had one, a cold winter last winter. Yeah, that was the coldest winter well, I can remember, and all the snow we got here in Virginia Beach. I am not ready for that yet. Have you been listening to this stuff in Ferguson, Missouri? Have you, the news has well, been... Well, they finally came <clears throat> out and said that there was evidence that uh, Brown charged the officer and beat his face in. His occipital bone was crushed. This but, would have been nice information yeah. to have about a week well, ago. I don't understand why they haven't done a blood test on that guy, on the dead man, yeah. to see if he had PCP or some other kind of uh, hallucinogenic uh, material. Because he acted like somebody who was crazy. I believe that he, they did show that there he had been smoking pot. Well, pot and, wouldn't make you do the stuff he yeah. did. It had to be something worse than that. But in any event, he charges the officer. And for somehow, they make this big racial case. And Eric Holder goes down and said, you don't understand what it's like to be a black man. And I was pulled over by the cops years ago, and my vehicle was searched. OK, the big, great, six-foot-five giant charges this little cop and beats the daylights out of him. And the cop is in fear of his life. Now, he shot him too many times, no question. Yeah. One or two would have probably deterred him. and and. That was bad, but nevertheless, police can use deadly force to keep from being sure. killed. And, and nice to have a stun gun in a situation like that, too. Uh, much better. Mm -hmm. But in any of this, some, this some error, error. But to, to, to have the national thing, and of course, uh, you know, the friendly preacher of Tawana Brawley comes in, and um, he, he makes a statement, and everybody makes a statement, and all these activists come in from California and New York. It's an outrage. And then the Russians come in and, and say, well, you see, you've got your own problems. How dare you preach to us? It just looks bad. But if we'd just gotten the facts earlier, I can't understand why they withheld this stuff. This big guy robs us a convenience store, pushes the clerk uh, to one side, goes marching down the street, blocking traffic, and the cop tries to stop him. And then they said, well, the cop didn't know he'd done something in the convenience store. Now it says, yes, he did know. And you know, the whole thing, well, why didn't they get the facts out? I know. I was same thought last night. Why? This, that yeah. was criminal in itself, withholding Completely. that information. Completely. And, and, yeah. and this stuff perhaps yeah. would have been avoided. But uh, yeah. now, oh, oh man. And, but Eric Holder, grandstanding, I'm going to stand up for the oppressed. I mean, did the big guy beat the cop up? And if he did, the cop had a right to stop him. But the question is, you're right, he should have had a stun gun, but maybe they didn't offer, they didn't issue stun guns to them. That would have stopped him. Yeah. Well, I'm sad to see it, but um, whew, this era of racial tension, and it's been a hot summer. Wendy. All right, when we come back, we'll go behind the scenes of the new movie, When the Game Stands Tall. Meet the stars of the film and the coaches of the real high school that owns a world football record, get this, 151 consecutive wins. Stay tuned. College where you'll be getting more than an education. Student loan debt is greater than credit card debt. And why? The system is unbelievably corrupt. Here's how you can get the most from higher ed. Students don't get that anymore. Plus, from when the game stands tall. That's not who we are. We need to stand back up and find our way again. Scott Ross sits down with actor Jim Caviezel. That is very uh, reminiscent of our faith. Tomorrow on The 700 Club. Well, you're watching the 700 Club News and commentary and inflammatory things, fair and balanced, of course. <laughs> well, he took over a high school football program that had never won a single game. Then for the next 12 years, 
the teams never lost a game, leading to a world record 151 consecutive wins. A new movie about this legendary coach opens in theaters tomorrow. And as Ephraim Graham reports, it starts with game 152, when this phenomenal winning streak came to a stunning halt. De La Salle High School owns a high school football record, 12 years without ever losing a game. But you won't find any signs boasting about it at the California Catholic School. And that's the mark of the team's mild-mannered and modest leader, Bob Latticer, who began coaching the Spartans in 1979. Coach, when you signed on to, to teach religious studies uh, at the school and then signed on to, to be coached, the team had never won a game. What made you say yes to the job? Um, I was young, and I, I, it was, I was 24 at the time, and I thought, I'm going to give this a shot and see what I can do. And I was even trying to seek my own level of competence or what I was meant to do, because I really didn't know. And I, wanted, I thought, this might be it. I mean, I felt real comfortable about football. I, I felt, had a good feel for the game, and I, I thought, let's give it a shot. And I, once I got into it, it only took me a year, and I thought, this is what I'm meant to do. Coach Ladd's perfect 151-game record produced NFL stars like Maurice Jones-Drew, DJ Williams, and TJ Ward. It's a winning record that inspired a book, and now a movie. Come on, Bob, you turned this team into a winning machine. How long do you think you can keep the streak alive? The streak was never our goal. But when the game stands tall begins with game 152, when the winning streak ends and things fall apart for the coach and his team, on and off the field. DNA! Call 911! Actor Jim Caviezel plays the coach, a role he admits is tough, with real life players and Coach Lad fans watching to see if he nails it. It's been said of the, the Coach Lad role that whoever played that role would have to plunge himself into the toughest year of a complicated man's life. What was the challenge for you in that role? Normally when you do a script, you have the, just the, the foundation of the script that you're working on. This one, there's another one, and that's him. And then who are we gonna get to um, you know, play Terry, that, that that was a, you know, this is an odd couple, and this is a very, <laughs> there were a lot of things that could go wrong that didn't go wrong. Terry Edson is Coach Ladd's animated assistant. Hey, hey, we don't do that here. Reporters, friends, family, strangers, they're all gonna ask the same thing. What happened? This is a question that's gonna follow you. How did you lose the streak? played by actor Michael Every Chiklis. I mean, naturally, they want to win the games they play, but really what they want to accomplish is uh, mentoring these boys into young men who can be relied upon. Break it up! The De La Salle Spartan story is tougher off the field with real-life player Cameron Colvin. He lost both parents before his sophomore year, and that was only the beginning of his pain. His best friend and teammate is shot and killed just two days before they were to leave together for college. People always ask me what it's like to never lose. Today I am lost. Sidarius Blaine plays the role of Cameron. What is it about him you think that allows him to push through hell on earth, essentially? Support, brotherhood. Yeah. That's it. You know, the, he has the support <clears throat> of, of 60 brothers on, on one football team. Uh, who won't let him fall into despair. That is the message of the movie is that I think, you know, you can't do it alone. Like, it, you, need to, you need to have the strength to depend on someone. And that's sometimes the hardest thing to do, is to, to actually ask somebody for help. This is a football film about a modest man dedicated to raising mighty men. This film, many people watching it, left in tears. What is it about the story, you think, that has people crying watching a football film? Because it's about kids, and it's about their lives, and it's about, you know, them navigating through life and learning. And we've been fortunate. We get to see that every year. And, uh, and we've cried our, cried our own tears in real time. I think redemption always brings a tear. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Los Angeles.
Thanks, Ephraim. And on tomorrow's 700 Club, Scott Ross brings us a one-on-one -on -one interview with Jim Caviezel, the star of When the Game Stands Tall. And if you can't wait until Friday, you can check out Scott's interview right now on our Facebook page. Just go to facebook.com slash 700 Club. Well, from high school football to the NFL, up next, meet the wide receiver who got a message from God that became a game changer. He began to show me all the times being in a gang neighborhood, selling drugs out of my grandmother's house, all the times my house was shot up and nobody was killed from it, and how he protected me over and over again. Carolina Panther Jason Avant relives his epiphany coming up. Jason Avant is an NFL wide receiver who started selling drugs at the ripe old age of sixth grade. Sports became his ticket out of gang life. But as he told reporter Tom, uh, Tim Branson, he would never have made it to the pros without the prayers of his grandmother. NFL wide receiver Jason Avant has become known for his sure hands and clutch plays. In his eight seasons with the Philadelphia Eagles, he emerged as a leader and a role model. Still, he was released by the franchise and picked up by the Carolina Panthers. Jason says it's all a matter of perspective. The game of football, I love to play, but in the grand scheme of life, it's this big. <laughs> Jason's outlook stems from a life of adversity. As a young boy, he lived with his grandmother in the projects of Southside Chicago. Most of the relatives that lived with them were gangbangers. Drug deals and drive-by shootings were just a part of life. I understood what it was like to come in a house with, you know, $1,000 for making drug deals because I was selling drugs in the sixth grade. Jason's grandmother took him to church and prayed for him constantly hoping he would find a way out. I was young and I was her second chance on life. Her children didn't turn out the way she wanted them to. So her prayers were for me, Lord, let him be different. Lord, let his life be one that will serve you. Let him escape these streets. Let him do your will. A battle raged in Jason's mind between God's truth and the reality of life. And because of that environment, it made me bitter and callous toward God, even though I knew my grandmother had something that I wanted, but I still couldn't see me serving him when some people in the world could have affluence and other people could have the bottom of the barrel, and I didn't understand that. Even then, Jason says his grandmother's words were sinking in. I tell you the truth, I was the worst gang member slash drug dealer ever because I, my grandmother gave me too much truth for, for me to be comfortable in that environment. and. Uh, and you couldn't ignore it. I couldn't ignore it. In the midst of the chaos, it became clear that Jason was a gifted athlete. On the playgrounds of Chicago, he decided that basketball would be his ticket out. But when his grandmother moved them to a new neighborhood with a new school, he found his passion in football. And one year playing receiver, I was the number one player in the state of Illinois. And it was like, uh, like a dream come true. Mm -hmm. Jason became an All-American and signed with the University of Michigan. He thought college would get him away from all his grandmother's talk about God and Jesus. I get to the University of Michigan, and I get room with the pastor's son. <laughs> <laughs> I get room with <laughs> Wherever you go, man. Wherever I go, right? Listen, <laughs> right? So I'm like, man, here I am again with these, you know, crazy religious people, right? It and, still hadn't sunk in, though, had it? It still hadn't sunk in. <laughs> <laughs> but it soon would. When Jason first came to Michigan, he expected to be a star. After all, he was a top recruit. Instead, he found himself on the bench and stewing. And I'm pouting on the bench. I'm so <laughs> mad because I'm not playing, I'm not dressed. Then Jason had an epiphany. And I'm sitting there on the bench like, man, I'm being a real baby right now. I'm missing this exciting game. And so the fourth quarter, I get up off my seat and I begin to cheer with the crowd and get the crowd pumped up. And um, we end up winning the game on the last second field goal from 56 yards and win by one. And it was the, the greatest, one of the greatest victories that um, I've ever had um, 
as an athlete, and, and it has nothing to do with the win, but it was more so me dying to self, and then I made my life about others, and, and uh, it was one of those moments where um, I saw how selfish I, I was. With a new attitude, Jason finished out the season and even saw some playing time. But he admits his heart was still empty. So at the end of his freshman year, Jason went to church, where he says he heard from God. He began to show me all the times being in a gang um, neighborhood and be selling drugs out of my grandmother's house. All the times my house was shot up and nobody was um, killed from it and how he protected me over and over again. The last thing he showed me is like how he gave me this talent that I didn't know I had and um, how he used football to bring me to this place. And he began to just replay all of these things over in my mind. And at the end of that, it was as the Spirit speaking to me, after all I've done for you, Jason, you can't live your life for me. And the Bible says that it's the goodness of the Lord that brings us to repentance. He was so good to me, so merciful to me, so kind to me. At May 4th, 2003, I finally said yes and surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. Afterwards, Jason went to see his grandmother. And I was able to go there and say, you know what? I thank you for showing me that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. I thank you for all your prayers. I thank you for being a good person. I thank you for helping me find the right path. And I tell you that because of you, I surrendered my life to Christ. And it was the happiest day of her life because she enjoyed me going to the University of Michigan. But her goal in my life was that I was finally surrendered. <laughs> and I finally surrendered to God. And, and that next year, she passed. And uh, it seemed like she stayed around long enough for me to find Jesus Christ. After having a stellar career with the Wolverines, Jason went on to have eight productive seasons with the Philadelphia Eagles, where by all accounts, he was admired and respected by his team and the community. Now with the Carolina Panthers, Jason knows his days in the NFL will eventually come to an end. But he says no matter what might come his way, he knows God will pull him through. And that's what I love about God, is that he's a God of the comeback. It seems like it's always going down and it seems like it's never going to work out, but he has the power to raise up dead things. He's the resurrection and the life. And um, I was definitely on my way down, but I know him now to be the resurrection and the life. He's the resurrection and the life. Jason Avant, what an amazing thing. Star football player, but it, that wasn't it. A praying grandmother. Many of you in this audience have had praying mothers. You've had praying grandmothers. And you know, you can go away from them. You can go into sin. You can sell drugs. You can take drugs. You can drink. You can party. Uh, you can go after money. You can do all these things but you'll never get away from the prayers of your mother and the prayers of your grandmother. These godly women who have prayed and prayed. In Jason's case, his grandmother's prayers were answered and your mother's prayers are gonna be answered. I know what a, a praying mother is. I had a praying mother. She prayed for her son and her prayers were answered. You can't escape the prayers of your mother. You can't escape them because God has heard the prayers of these godly women who ye night after night have been on their knees crying out to God. And right now, the Lord is speaking to you and he says, listen, listen to my voice. I've got something wonderful for you. Pray with me now. Bow your head, Lord God, I'm aware of the prayers of my godly mother and grandmother. I'm aware of their love for me. And right now, Father, I'm not going to fight any longer. I'm going to surrender to you because I know that I'm surrounded by love. And I know you've kept me for this moment. And so I pray right now, Father, and I ask for a special anointing of your spirit I give myself to you. I receive you as Savior. 
and I make you Lord of my life. Thank you. Well, if you prayed with me just then, I want you to have something to help you. Uh, we have this prepared. We've had it for some time. But uh, I have a little compact disc. It's a little thing, <clears throat> no bigger than my hand here, a little thin thing. And it's got 73 minutes of intense teaching about what just happened to you. And I want to give it to you free if you just call in and say, I prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to the Lord. I have surrendered to the prayers that went before. I'll send this to you. A telephone number is 1-800-759-0700. Call in. Here's Wendy. Thanks, Pat. Well, up next, your email questions. Scott says, I listen to a lot of 70s and 80s rock music. Is that wrong of me as a Christian? Stay tuned for Pat's answer when we bring it on. Welcome back to the 700 Club. The Supreme Court is delaying the start of same-sex marriage in Virginia. The court has granted a request from a county clerk in Northern Virginia to block same-sex marriages in the state while the issue is being appealed. Without court intervention, same-sex marriages would have started today. Most other federal court decisions in favor of same-sex marriage in other states have also been put on hold. Hall of Fame quarterback Jim Kelly is cancer free. Doctors first diagnosed him with oral cancer in the middle of 2013 and removed the tumors, but they found a recurrence of that cancer back in March. The doctors now say chemotherapy and radiation treatments have eliminated his illness and his pain. And the former Buffalo Bills quarterback is now able to function normally. His long battle prompted support from thousands on social media with the catchphrases Kelly tough and prayers for JK. Kelly told ESPN, I still need those prayers. And you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, when a Hindu farmer needed clean water, he decided to do something radical, something a Hindu doesn't normally do. Mm -hmm. This Hindu prayed to Jesus for help. And here's what happened next. Raising livestock in the hills of Northwest India can be a very difficult job, especially if you don't have a close water source. Sohan had to walk two miles to get water for his family, cattle, and goats. He begged his Hindu gods for help but nothing changed. Then a local pastor encouraged him to pray to Jesus. In my heart, I would pray to Jesus every morning, noontime, and evening for water close to my home. It wasn't long until Sohan saw his prayers answered. CBN's Living Waters team came to his village and drilled a well. This well is a big blessing to my family and village. It is also a blessing for my cattle and goats. Now I can bathe them and give them plenty of water to drink. I am so happy. Sohan and his family gave their lives to Christ. And they weren't the only ones. 168 other villagers were baptized because they saw the well as a tangible sign that God is real and he loves them. I believe Jesus Christ is the one true God because he gave me water after I prayed for a well. My family drinks water from it and they are happy and at peace. When I die, I know I will be in heaven with Jesus Christ. The well of living water, that's what your uh, contributions do. Uh, you put flesh on the prayers that people pray to Jesus. We're his hand extended. And uh, if you want to participate in something like that, pick up your telephone and call and say, you can count on me. I think it's very important. We need your help that we could help others. And as we all join together, lives are being transformed all over the world. And some of you want to do a little something more, and we have found that it costs a good deal of money to send out receipts and things like that, and we like to do it because it's important. But there's some people who say, well, look, I can help save you money and do something easier if I just notify my bank or my uh, financial institution to make an automatic transfer uh, to CBN or Operation Blessing 
And uh, those who do, it's called Pledge Express. And it, we have an, another extra money that we can send out uh, this teaching, Powerful Life, every month. So we can send you something extra that will be a blessing in your life. So call in, join the 700 Club, and if you say you want to get involved in Pledge Express, they'll tell you how to do it. So now we got some questions. Yeah, and this is a good one because I think a lot of Christians wonder about oh, this. Scott writes it. in, what is your outlook on certain types of music such as hard rock, classic rock, rap, etc.? I've been a Christian for the majority of my life and I listen to a lot of 70s and 80s rock music. There was a lot of good rock back in those days. Is that wrong of me as a Christian? Well, you know, uh, there are a lot of those songs that are pretty good, you know, um, Bridge Over Troubled Waters and things like that. Uh, I think some of this... Uh, uh, gangster rap. I think some of the uh, uh, heavy metal stuff is really satanic. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like demonic, yes. but there's a lot of the music that came out of the 60s and 70s that's really good, and I enjoy listening to it too. So, One of my first concert was Boston in 1979. Really? Oh my gosh, I'm dating myself. I was, yeah. I was very young. Yo, but just, <laughs> just a child. I understand. <laughs> But I mean, really, there's nothing <laughs> sinful about that, I don't think. I mean, there's some good good lyrics and good music, and there's some, I mean, the kids are having fun, but some of the stuff that's come out later, I mean, it's it's like a killer, and I'm going to take the hoe, and I'm going to, you know, do this, that, and the other. Yeah. I mean, it's full of rape and murder and violence. That's evil. That's All right. right. All right. Carl writes, we may receive a $100,000 settlement. We are on Social Security. We're thinking of paying off our mortgage. Or is there a means of a steady 5% on this amount? Well, uh, I've said many, many times, I like what are called uh, these master limited partnerships. What's happened is that gas companies, uh, oil companies, uh, have been acting like um, uh, utilities, and as the oil and gas flows through their pipes, uh, they, they can pay a regular uh, income. And some of them, uh, like Enterprise Products or Enterplus or some of these others, they they uh, they pay uh, not five percent; they pay six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent. Um, I mentioned Kinder Morgan had a special payout, and I think their deal is up to as much as twenty-six percent. At least it's not regular, but it's that's how much the accounts have gone up because of a financial thing they did. But I, 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 if you can ask a broker, if you can look under MLP, Master Limited Partnerships, make sure they're solid, make sure that they're regular, and and you could not just put it all in one place, but go to several of them and get yourself a brokerage account and. Uh, th that would be the way to go, I think, rather than, uh, you might want to pay off a bill. It depends on how much interest you're paying on the loan that you want to pay off. But if you've got a loan that's at three or four or five percent, then you can probably do better. But uh, you pray and ask the Lord what to do. All right. All right. Tamara writes, my mom wants to know if to be baptized, you need to be totally immersed or is sprinkled okay? I so enjoy your program. Well, uh, I'm a Baptist. Baptists believe in immersion. That's where the whole Baptism comes from. Uh, in the um, Catholic Church, the early churches, they sprinkle. Uh, I, I, I think the whole concept is what's in your heart. It's an idea of you die to self, but uh, I believe in the New Testament, uh, it was immersion baptism. Here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? Jesus Christ was baptized in the Jordan River. He, he was immersed in the river and brought up. So uh, that's the biblical model. But uh, I'm not going to knock those that believe in sprinkling, Wendy. Hey man, might as well go for it. Go for it, all absolutely. the way. <laughs> well, coming we up. We can arrange for baptism <laughs> if you need a, a hand. All right. Thanks, Pat. Great answers. Great questions. And coming up, meet a man who was given a death sentence and has lived to defy it. Hear how he beat cancer with the help of his wife right after this. Welcome back to the 700 Club. One in three women will get cancer in her lifetime and one in two men. But despite the odds, Russell Pyle was in shock when he was diagnosed. Two years ago, Russell Pyle received a death sentence. He was diagnosed with an aggressive form of bladder cancer. Russell and his wife, Marion, braced themselves for the journey ahead. Though Russell agreed to the use of mainstream medical treatments, he also opted for newer natural remedies. 
In her book, Healed, Healthy, and Whole, Marion shares the spiritual and nutritional strategies they discovered in their battle against cancer and how they never gave up hope for a miracle. And Russell and Marion are with us now. Russell and Marion, welcome to the show. Great Thank to you very see much. You. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you for Wendy. having Appreciate us. It. Yes. Well, Russell, let's get right to it. You were the picture of health. You're working out all the time, eating right, and suddenly something went very wrong. What, when did you first know something was wrong with your health? I had blood in my urine. And the first symptoms I didn't think too much of, and then it continued. And so my GP said, you better go to a urologist and see what's going on. Yeah, so you weren't that worried at first, but you said, let's mm. go to the doctor. And, and, and what happened, Marion? Well, something that nobody ever wants to hear. We heard that he had bladder cancer, and we couldn't even imagine it. The word bladder and yes. the bladder can word cancer and Russell just didn't even fit in the same sentence. So it actually was a shock to us, and as it, that kind of news always is, and it turned our world upside down in an instant. So what was the first thing you did? You went conventional, right? Conventional medicine, which is chemo. Yeah, well, no, no chemo. Chemo wouldn't have any effect on this oh. cancer. So they uh, did surgery, took out the tumor, and then I went back in for a couple other uh, surgeries, essentially, which were biopsies, but they were under full anesthesia. And... Um, that was the approach. Then this same doctor gave me BCG, which is Bacillus um, colmet-garin, which is a um, tuberculosis bacteria that they put in the bladder that inflames the bladder and helps fight the cancer. So those were f from the conventional doctor. Well, the two of you decided, you know, we're going to fight this a little differently. You took a three-way uh, three approach to battling this cancer. First one was spiritual, then... Um, nutritional and then alternative. We're going to talk about all those. How, what did you do spiritually? Well, as ever, whatever always happens when you're in a crisis, you turn to God and you fall on your face before him and say, Lord, what are you doing here and what do you want us to do here? So we literally were up at 2 a.m. praying until dawn if necessary. We just started to ask God what he wanted to do with this. We poured over scripture, Wendy, and we found those promises that jumped off the page at us and right into our hearts. And we knew those were the promises God was giving us. Mm. And we stood on those and we believed them. No matter what it looked like in our circumstances, we said, this is the word of God. This is the truth. And he promised us to heal us and we believed him so we memorized those and prayed them back to him we did this yeah. alone we did this together and then we mobilized prayer groups where we had up to a hundred people around the world wow. praying for Russell and we gave them the scriptures we gave them what we felt we God was telling us to pray for right. so people were focused in prayer it mm. wasn't just this let's all pray whatever sure. we feel we were all very focused mm, I like and that. we also did spiritual inventory mm. because cancer is complicated and mm. it can also be brought on not just from physical ailments and a breakdown in the immune system, but also because of trauma or mm. pain mm. or unresolved issues emotionally or spiritually. Yeah, so we did our own spiritual inventory and worked with a counselor and worked through some issues to just get unblocked and make sure nothing was going to impede the healing. Right. Okay. Russell, what did you do nutritionally? This is key. Yes, it was. And we feel it's probably the most, one of the most important besides seeking God's guidance in it. And we sought his guidance even as to what to do. Um, we started with a, an antifungal diet, which uh, fungus pre is a precursor to cancer, they believe. And everything that feeds fungus also feeds cancer. So mm. we went on a, a high antifungal diet. I mean, no sugar at well, all. Well, that would be, yeah, no sugar, no sugar, no anything that would create uh, a fast sugar, no white rice, no no even brown rice and at I, the beginning. And that was interesting. You said no wheat, no white rice because of the way it's stored. It oh. can cause the fungal. It the can grains cause are stored in the United States in a way that they have mycotoxins. They get mold on them. So if you consume that, you in, are ingesting fungus into your body, which is just terrible. It's a precursor to all kinds of disease, not just cancer, but it can be other kinds of disease too. Okay. And, and then we went to an 80-20 diet along with that, which was 20% animal protein and 80% uh, plant. Um, some people would recommend on severe cases mm. that we didn't feel we were quite there, 100% vegan, no animal protein. Yeah, I've heard that with fighting cancer, but so you said, do, now when you say protein, are you talking about red meat, fish, and chicken? or I'm talking just about any animal protein. Any, okay. Because they're acidic. And they produce, and we want to get the body into a, a neutral acid alkaline balance. And um, cancer hates uh, alkaline, but loves acid. 
Oh. So you want to keep, if you have to go full vegan to get rid of the, uh, acid. the acid condition, then that that's That is very interesting because I know a lot of people battle with too much acid in their system and trying to get, okay, so you're battling it spiritually, you've got the prayer going, you're battling it nutritionally, and then you're battling it also with alternative therapies. Yes. W what kind? Um, we did about eight different kinds of therapies which are detailed in the book, but I'll tell you about two of them which are interesting. Uh, one was the hyperbaric chamber, which was used for divers uh, to help from bends originally. And they put you in this glass tube and they fill it full of oxygen and take you down to uh, atmospheres. And you lay there for 90 minutes with this oxygen. Well, cancer hates oxygen. Healthy cells love oxygen. In fact, they heal under oxygen. I had never heard that before. That is so interesting. And it's in your book that cancer hates oxygen. That's right. So you're, you're taking the oxygen. Then, you, uh, then vitamin C therapy. I sat with a drip with uh, two, uh, two liters of, uh, or two bags. Like I'm pure not sure. Vitamin my, C. Uh, vitamin C in solution intravenously while I sat and read a book. <laughs> and uh, the combination of the oxygen and the vitamin C produce hydrogen peroxide, which is lethal to cancer. Okay, guys, okay. tell me what happened 10 months later, just 10 months after you're doing all these things, what was the diagnosis, Russell? You are cancer free. In fact, the nurse said when we called, oh, I have to go get your records, which was over after Christmas and we were dying to know. And she said, uh, oh, uh, it, it's, which it's, Oh, it was, a, it was negative. It's, it's negative. negative. And I said, well, what does negative mean? I know, right? That doesn't sound good. <laughs> yeah. And she said, no, you're cancer free. Yeah. Well, praise the Lord. Praise and we've God. been cancer free for a year and a half. Well, you guys have an awesome book out called Healed, Healthy, and Whole. It has a lot more. And I love the way it almost reads like a devotional. You're going to love this. Uh, you're, it's available wherever books are sold. Mary and Russell, great having you on the show. Thanks thank so much you for so your much. testimony. Oh, thank, thank you. Lynn. What a pleasure. Appreciate it. Pat, so inspirational. What an amazing story. I think it's wonderful. I hope people liked it. Hey, by the way, a little program note. Tomorrow, the famous dog... Princess Maggie will be here to show a few tricks. People like dogs, and we're going to, I'm going to bring the little dog to let you uh, get to know her better. And we leave you with today's Power Minute. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. And also, Scott Ross goes one on one with actor Jim Caviezel on tomorrow's program, in addition to Princess Maggie. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. College, where you'll be getting more than an education. Student loan debt is greater than credit card debt. And why? The system is unbelievably corrupt. Here's how you can get the most from higher ed. Students don't get that anymore. Plus, from when the game stands tall. That's not who we are. We need to stand back up and find our way again. Scott Ross sits down with actor Jim Caviezel. That is very uh, reminiscent of our faith. Tomorrow on The 700 Club.